This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. So the Big Bang. Big Bang is a. Um, if you're just uh, just arriving at UC Davis and you hear about Big Bang, you want to know what it is. Big Bang is a one-of-a-kind program in the Sacramento region. The Big Bang is a business plan competition to create, to build, putting together business school students and people from different parts of the university. Develop their ideas, meet the right folks. Uh, it gives a, a would-be entrepreneur an opportunity to test drive an idea that they have. You know, put together plans for workable businesses. Taking an idea and putting everything into it and building it. To build something that has great value. Big Bang was formed about 10 years ago um, at UC Davis by a group of students. And the reason was, they, they said, what can we do to create a competition so that we can um, have business plans kind of rise to the top? Uh, it's grown since then in the past 10 years into a terrific uh, regional institution which helps new companies get started, get on their feet, and find the early funding and the early connections to be effective. There's certain benefits to the community, absolutely. Through Big Bang, you get to learn in a very practical sense, not a theoretical sense. It's a great process. It's a great um, learning experience. Regional investors, uh, uh, lawyers in the area that all have very valuable uh, uh, perspectives and you get to spend uh, a considerable amount of time uh, you know, collecting their uh, uh, their collective wisdom. The benefits to us and to the community are you know quite frankly the, de the development of a whole group of entrepreneurial people who are either going to start businesses through the Big Bang or you know may go out and start their own business. The results from all that hard work is, is really rewarding. Learning to look at these things uh, from the perspective of a potential investor is, is, is just invaluable. Big Bang is where you will meet people from across the Sacramento region who can help you make your ideas a reality. And you get to test your ideas, you get to refine your ideas, you get to abort your ideas and start with new things. Create jobs, um, you know, grow businesses, um, create wealth for investors, things of that nature. Um, I think anyone who has an idea. Anyone with an idea and with the entrepreneurial spirit. Local entrepreneurs, technology executives. And maybe there's a professor or a graduate student. Clearly it's a, it, it would be of great benefit to folks who want to go into the business and want to understand uh, you know, building a business. It takes a, um, a willingness to be very, very um, uh, uh, realistic about your business. If you want to get a job or work for somebody else, Big Bang is not for you. Go get a job, go do something else. But if you aspire to create a company, if you aspire to build something, Big Bang is the best resource, it's the best program. It'll be the most rewarding thing that you can do while you're a student or while you're involved with the entrepreneurial community. Uh, the best way to find out more about the Big Bang program is to contact the UC Davis Graduate School of Management. Yeah, if you've got an idea, join Big Bang. Either that or wait 30 years and tell everybody you had that idea and you didn't do anything with it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vlad Loskatov. I'm the chair of the 2010 Big Bang Business Plan Competition. Thank you all for joining us for the 10th annual Big Bang final event. It's been a long road for our contestants this year. Following a series of mixers and workshops, over 40 teams submitted business ideas at the start of the competition. These were then whittled down to just over 20 teams who competed in the Little Bang Pitch Competition. After Little Bang, 10 teams were, se were selected to compete in tonight's final event. Today, our judges have narrowed the field to five finalists, and shortly you will hear pitches from these top five teams. They will be competing for $27,000 in cash and prizes. The Big Bang Business Plan competition is the embodiment of the three pillars that GSM was founded on. Innovation, found in the spark of entrepreneurship, demonstrated by each of our team members. Collaboration, ex exemplified in the teamwork found in everyone who competed in Big Bang. And lastly, 
Each of these teams is an example of the excellence found in every individual, both here at UC Davis and in the greater Sacramento area. Tonight is a chance to see individuals who have dreamed, worked, strived, and realized, people who are truly putting ideas into action. After five teams have presented, each of you will have a chance to select the People's Choice winner. Once the People's Choice ballots have been tabulated, we will announce both the judges' winners and the winner of the People's Choice Award. Before we begin, I would like to first extend a thank you to all of our judges who have worked tirelessly throughout today to narrow our field down to our five finalists. Your 10th annual Big Bang judges are Scott Lynette with DFJ Frontier, Ian Mickle with Bhutan Gibson, Kevin Coyle with DLA Piper, Greg Rebar with SMUD, Roger Akers with Akers Capital, Harry Laswell with American River Ventures, and Peter Bernardoni with Wavepoint Ventures. I would also like to say thank you to this year's mentors who supported, advised, and guided our teams on their collective journeys. I'd like to ask any Big Bang mentor mentors who are present this evening to please rise so that we can recognize you for your support of our teams. Thank you for your support. And last but not least, I would also like to thank our sponsors whose contributions make this event and this entire comp competition possible. At the platinum level, DLA Piper. The gold level, DFJ Frontier. The silver level, Bhutan Gibson. The Grant Farm. The Sacramento Municipal Utility District. And at the bronze level, Acres Capital. American River Ventures. Central Valley Fund. Five Star Bank, Horizon Incorporated, Intel Corporation, the LFL Financial Foundation, Sacramento Angels, Sarda, Sierra Energy, Silver's HR Management, Townsend and Townsend and Crew, Velocity Venture Capital, Wavepoint Ventures, and Wirefly.com. I would also like to thank Tracy Neal and Miller Coors for their generous donation to tonight's final event. And now I'm pleased to introduce the Dean of the Graduate School of Management here at UC Davis, Stephen Corral. Good evening, everyone. Wow, it's great to see you here. I love this uh, energy that we have here tonight. What a great turnout and um, delighted to see such a broad cross-section of uh, faculty and staff and students from across campus. I see lots of my friends and colleagues from different academic units on campus, so uh, delighted that you're uh, here to join us for the uh, 10th annual uh, Big Bang competition, which was launched by our students uh, 10 years ago and remains entirely student-run and self-supporting. I love that uh, entrepreneurial and enterprising spirit by our students. I uh, personally have also been involved in uh, business plan competitions in the past, and I see the fantastic energy that can happen in an event like this. It's an amazing educational opportunity for our students outside the classroom, and it really brings together uh, people from the business community, from the financial investment community, technologists, scientists, and engineers, and our MBA students. So it's really a terrific mix of uh, talent and human capital all around uh, the business plan competition. So I'm really delighted that, uh, that you, could, you could join us. Uh, as many of you know, last week we had the honor of hosting uh, Governor Schwarzenegger at the E3 event, Economic Prosperity, Energy, and the Environment. And um, when I think of the significance and impact of the entrepreneurial spirit of the Big Bang, it's sort of related to something that he said in his remarks. So let me give you this quote. UC Davis is a university that doesn't just talk about and theorize about the kind of interesting things that you develop here, but also you put it on the market and you make it workable and it has such a tremendous effect. As you can imagine, that, that uh, statement by the governor generated lots of applause by the, uh, by the crowd uh, last week. So now the uh, finalist teams you'll be seeing this evening exemplify what happens when you mix cutting edge technology, a solid business plan, and uh, prize money as well. So the Big Bang is really a showcase of the energy and the entrepreneurial spirit that's going on here at UC Davis. 
And many of us are working to build that entrepreneurial spirit as well, building connections among the GSM, among engineering, science, medicine, law, and so on. So you're really seeing this event as sort of the culmination of that energy and that uh, chemistry. Now I'd like to uh, especially thank uh, Vlad, who's the chair of this, this year's Big Bang uh, Committee, and the rest of the student committee. Would Vlad and the rest of the committee please stand so we can recognize them? That is great. I, I want to echo uh, Vlad's comments earlier uh, and his thanks to our sponsors who have underwrote more than $28,000 of, of prize money. And I also want to thank also the uh, volunteer mentors and the judges who have given their time and their financial support uh, this year. It really takes a great deal of time and energy to organize an event like this. Uh, it's really a little bit like running a startup itself. Um, and uh, requires the students to solicit funding, very much like a startup, uh, to market the contest, to engage customers and deliver on their promises, and uh, all of that's culminating in the com uh, competition and the $28,000 in prize money. And the students have done a terrific job on that. Now, before we actually begin uh, the announcements, I'd like to take a moment to award the James R. and Georgia K. Corbett Fellowship. The Corbett Fellowship is for a student entrepreneur who provides an, an and, and it's an annual award for the graduate student graduate school of management student with the motivation, potential, and passion for succeeding in the entrepreneurial world. Awards such as these are a big part of why students are, are drawn to the vibrant uh, learning environment here in the GSM. So the uh, fellowship uh, recipient this year is Sam Weiner. Where is Sam? Okay, Sam. <laughs> so well done, Sam. We know uh, no one loves Sam, and as you may know, he, uh, he was um, last year's committee chair uh, for the Big Bang, and he'll be graduating this spring to join a small technology company in Cleveland, Ohio, which I think your hometown, is that correct? Yes? Back to Cleveland and he'll be a uh, product manager there. And his intent is to be an entrepreneur. So a lot of you are probably familiar with entrepreneurship, which is essentially being an entrepreneur in a large company. So Sam, all the best to you and congratulations. <clears throat> all right, now let's uh, continue on with why we're really here to uh, get on with the Big Bang presentation. So, Vlad? Or, sorry, Matt. Matt Talbot's taking over. Matt. Good evening. Uh, my name's Matt Talbot. I'm the co-director of finance and external relations, and it's my pleasure to present to you the first team to present tonight, Nomad. If you'd like to come up here and... Hi, everybody. I'm Todd Armstrong, this is Sunit Sandhu. We're here from uh, Nomad Technologies, and we'd like to tell you about a solution we've been working on called Hyperdrive. So Hyperdrive is based on a technology called Metal Organic Silicon Thin Film, which we call MoStiff for short. And specifically what we're using this technology for is to increase the capacity of hard drives by 800%. So without getting into a lot of techno babble and things like that, I just want to give you a few bullets about the technology. It was developed here by the College of Engineering and they patented it for uh, micro and nanofabrication, which is the umbrella that uh, hard drive manufacturing falls under. And specifically, what it allows you to do is incorporate metals into organic films, which can then be applied to a silicon wafer, which becomes the platter that's used in a hard drive. And the reason why that's, that's interesting is that it allows us to present a read-write area at the nano scale, whereas uh, contemporary hard drives operate at the micro scale. And the thing that got us really excited about this technology is that we're not talking about a, a major impact on standard hard drive design. We're just talking about swapping out the platter. So we're not going to go to somebody like Western Digital and say, you need to scrap your whole production line. we got a whole new thing for you. We're talking about an incremental change that will allow for a, a major impact. So the, the issue facing hard drive manufacturers is they're, they're competing with each other. They have uh, aspects of the hard drive they're continuously trying to improve. 
disk space, read write speeds, things like that. And while that's going on, technologies like solid state drives are coming on the market and taking market share. So what we're talking about doing is giving these hard drive manufacturers a way to extend the lifespan of the technology they've invested so much capital in developing. Thanks, Todd. So uh, I'd like to talk about the market for a bit. So the worldwide HDD market is valued at $20.3 billion today. And it's expected to grow by 9% by the end of the year. And we expect this to grow, especially when leveraging the hyperdrive solution. An interesting piece of information that IBM had put out is that the cloud computing market is expected to grow over 28% by the year 2012. Now, why is this interesting? Virtualization revolutionized the efficiency for the server world. And we believe this, this is similar to what Hyperdrive Solution will do for the storage world. So in terms of servers, they were, be able, they were able to reduce them from four to one. With the Hyperdrive Solution, we believe that, for example, enterprise level systems will be able to drop eight server uh, storage racks down to one storage rack, tying to the eight times over capacity increase that the Hyperdrive Solution provides. And also, the other thing is they can also increase the capacity. And the reason why we need to do this is data is increasing. Information week, an Information Week survey uh, that was sent out in 2009 and 2010 basically states that respondents are saying that they are managing more and more data year over year, whether it's from one terabyte to 100 ter terabytes. What this means is these enterprises need to increase the amount of capacity their storage uh, is available to them in their data centers. Uh, talking about the competitive landscape for a second, the main competition from a technological perspective to HDD technology is solid state drive technology, or SSD. Now, hard disk drive manufacturers still have the upper hand here because solid state drive technology per gigabyte is at least three times more expensive than hard disk drive uh, technology. And this could be even 20 times over depending on the amount of capacity because as solid state drive capacity increases, the cost exponentially increases as well. So hard disk drive manufacturers still have the upper hand, and there's still a huge market marketplace for HDD technology. Just to give you a little overview of the market landscape we're talking about so there's not much confusion, first we have technology materials. That's Nomad Technology Incorporated. Then we have imprinting machine manufacturers. Now these are the manufacturers that actually create the equipment to, to write to, or create these platters that get used in hard drives that the next group, the hard drive manufacturers, actually sell to the end clients such as yourselves or enterprises. So how are we going to get to the market? By three steps. First, proof of concept. We're working with the UC, um, the UC Davis College of Engineering to actually take the most of technology and prove that it can be written to and read from. Second, prototype. We're looking to work with a partner to actually prototype a hard drive working with the hyperdrive solution. So it, is, it runs the full gamut of tests that any hard drives run through today to show that it does what we say it will do. And three, partnership. So NTI, we're looking to secure a partnership with an imprinting machine manufacturer so that we can bring hyperdrive to market. This may look a little familiar to you, but we want to get into more specifics. Our target market are the hard drive manufacturers themselves. So we look to partner with an imprinting machine manufacturer, but the end customer is actually the hard drive manufacturers for Nomad Technologies Incorporated. Now we have four revenue streams that we're targeting in our business model. First, licensing fees. For any of the hard drive manufacturers to work with us or leverage the hyperdrive solution, we'll, we'll look for a $2 million licensing fee. Two, imprinting machines. For every imprinting machine sold via our imprinting machine manufacturing partner, we're looking to get 25% of the revenue. Material sales. So the actual materials that go into creating the hyperdrive solution, the chemicals, we will look for 120% markup on material sales. And per platter fees, we also look to gain revenue from each platter sold. I won't go into too much detail about the revenue projections, but a couple things I will point out. So by the end of 2012, our prototype should be ready to go to market. That means it's been proven. At the beginning of 2013, we look to get our first customer. By the end of 2013, we will break even. And within, based on this five-year projection, by the end of 2015, we will have a little under $6 million of cash on hand. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our short-term and long-term plans here. This is our milestone chart. Uh, so you'll see several steps Sunit mentioned. Um, the proof of concept we're working on sort of immediately, and then uh, following that, we'll begin the prototype hard drive uh, step, and, and then the extensive testing process. That's sort of our, our first make or break uh, moment for our company, is proving that, techno proving that the technology can handle being uh, used in a, in a rack-mounted system that gets vibrated and has to deal with intense heat and things like that. 
And then finally, we'll go to market with our partner, our uh, imprinting machine manufacturer partner. So I'm not going to read you this huge wall of text. This is a, some bios. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about our bios. Um, this is the team that's been working with uh, the College of Engineering to bring to uh, commercialize the most of technology under the banner Hyperdrive. So this is our, our advisory board. Um, the first two individuals on here are the inventors of the technology, Dr. Yagmai and Dr. Davis. And they, they came to us about, with this technology and, and we got really excited about it and we came back to them with a business plan and we've worked um, through several steps of getting the business plan uh, worked out. And speaking of that, we have Barbara Grant, who's a managing director at American River Ventures. She's uh, been instrumental in helping us sort of get our head out of the clouds and make sure our ideas are grounded in reality and served as a, a you know, a sounding board for um, our ideas. So she's, she's been really, really helpful. And then Mark Lowe, who's a managing partner at Praxis Ventures, has a lot of contacts within the industry, and he's helped us put us in contact with some really, you know, incredible individuals that have been really helpful in, in, in helping us work out this idea and how we, we can bring it to market. And this TBD bullet is why we have, we're hoping to bring one of those individuals on, onto our advisory board. And one of the people I'm, I'm really excited about is Finus Connor, who we've spoken to recently. This is a quote from him. He's the founder of Seagate and uh, later Connor Peripherals. And he, he immediately saw the potential for the technology and got excited about it, which of course completely invigorated us and drove us to be even more excited. So immediately what we're working on right now is, is working on the proof of concept project with the College of Engineering, doing some fundraising. That's why we're talking to you today, one of the reasons. And uh, while that project's going on, uh, we'll be trying to find a partner that can actually build our prototype and help us test it. And then we'd like to get into some early conversations with the imprinting machine manufacturer that we'd like to work with long term. So thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Thank you, Nomad. And now, PD Agnostics. Good afternoon. I'm Lorna DeLeos, CEO for PD Agnostics. We offer a platform technology to develop revolutionary diagnostic tests for children, enabling earlier and improved treatment. There is this horrible, deadly, rapidly progressing intestinal dis disease out there called necrotizing enterocolitis, or simply NEC. No one can predict to whom or when this life-threatening emergency will occur but it's killing 15,000 babies and costing $7.2 billion annually. Once neck reaches full stage, there's no effective treatment for it. In case the baby do survive, the baby faces a lifetime of debilitating effects. Sadly, the current tools we have now are not specific enough and neonatologists combine two or three tests in order to diagnose neck. There is simply no single rapid, non-invasive, and specific solution out there, and it's absolutely needed. But we have a solution to this phenomenal need. Our first product, NECDX, is the first specific test for neck. Using just the existing equipment in the hospitals and the baby's tool, NECDX can give accurate readings in minutes. This is the market. Premature babies weighing less than 1,500 grams are at high risk for neck. And they do require high monitoring. But those who do acquire neck need greater monitoring. Together, this makes a very large total addressable market of 2 billion. We have validated our our, the price of our test, the $200 per test, has been validated by the UCD Medical Center. And these figures will double when we expand our market to Europe and Asia. So currently, the combined panel of tests for NEC costs at least $400. So with NECDX, we can save $2 billion annually just in, tr in testing alone. And for the treatment, the infants who acquire full-blown neck would need to stay in the hospital for an additional 60 days, 
And with the early detection that we can provide using the NetDX, we'll be able to save $7.2 billion annually just for the treatment. So this is how NetDX wor works. So we detect the biomarkers in the stool of the babies, and then we capture these biomarkers with proprietary binding partners. So this then can give an accurate reading correlated to NEC. And the neonatologists can use this in order to give appropriate treatment. So right now, we have 36 babies enrolled in our NIH-funded study. And we, this is in collaboration with the UCD Medical Center. And we expect to, to file the patent by year one, by the beginning of year one. So these biomarkers are fairly new and can lead to many other potential diagnostic tests, such as for pneumonia, which is lined up our, as our second product, the new DX, and also for other diseases like enteric and diarrheal diseases. So these are our competitors. The current diagnostic tools are not specific enough, expensive, require long turnaround times, and have the risk of radiation or infection. Neonatologists combine two or more tests in order to diagnose neck. For example, Dr. Mark Underwood uses these four tests, the abdominal x-ray, the blood count, the blood culture, and the C-reactive protein, costing $440 and he gets the result in one to four days with the risk of radiation and infection, and it's still not specific enough. Another neonatologist, Dr. Brad, Brad Shaw from Duke University in North Carolina, uses radiological tests, the x-ray and the ultrasound, amounting to $630 and has the risk of radiation. So NECDX will eliminate, if not, or will lessen, if not eliminate, these disadvantages, enabling frequent testing, rapid treatment, and improved treatment. So NECDX will be accurate, faster, at half the cost. Simply put, NECDX will be better. So this is our business model. So we aim to create a paradigm shift in ped pediatric diagnostic testing. In order to get the NECDX to the hospitals and reference laboratories, the primary influencers, such as the neonatologists and the lab administrators, need to know that, that, that our product exists. So we will contact worldwide opinion leaders on NEC. These people will influence the world for us and will be the educators to their community. We will also publish in high-impact journals, such as Pediatrics and Journal of Gastroenterology, and we will set up booths and, and give presentations to annual conferences and meetings, such as the Pediatric Academic Society meeting. Also, initially, we will tag along our partners and give them a 30% discount. So regional managers who will manage and motivate these distributors will, will get commission based on their territory sales. And also with that, we will also sell our products to leading NICUs directly. And then after that, we will expand to California, to US, and eventually to Europe and Asia tapping the distribution channels, such as the BioRad and Gall laboratories. Also, we will publish press releases and give free samples. So this, this is our team. I am, we acknowledge our need for a CEO, and I am acting as an interim. I have several awards, publications, a patent, and over eight years of experience in research and development. Gerard, our C CFO, managed and spearheaded multi-million dollar projects. Cora, our COO, 
is very familiar with diagnostic startups, having worked at Genentech and Hope Laboratories and also at Helix Diagnostics, a company acquired by BioRed in 2001. Milady, our CTO, has over 100 citation, publication citations and over eight years of experience in research and development. We have world-renowned experts in our advisory board, Mark Underwood, a, ne a leading neonatologist, Carlito Librilla, an expert in glycan biomarker discovery, Bruce German, scientific advisor at NEC and highly cited in the field of nutrition, David Mills, a renowned microbiologist, and Andy and Will, great gurus in entrepreneurship. We expect our income at year three, so this is our revenue projections. So these revenues are based on 1.2, 2.4, and 3.6% market penetration rates. And these numbers are actually aligned with other diagnostic companies, such as ChemBio and BG Medicine during their startups. So the revenue is based on $200 per test, with $140 coming to us and the $60 going to the partners and the distributors. So in order to execute our plan, we, would, we expect to use the remaining 1.6 million grant from NIH and also the 5.5 million in equity financing. These are our milestones. We would need 1.2 million in the first round for the prototype utility patent and in license IP, and also to set up the facility. We would need an additional 4.3 million in order to do the validation studies, form the C-Corp, file the 510K FDA clearance and the CPT code, the marketing and the initial launch. And then we expect to launch our product, the NECDX at year two, and also the new DX, the one for pneumonia at year three. And the tests for enteric and diarrheal diseases are also our future products, and we expect to develop them in, this, in these years. So these are examples of recent acquisitions and multiples of diagnostic companies. So BioRad bought a segment, no, segments of Biotest AG for 67.57 million at 15.87x, on earnings, and Abbott bought, acquired Solvay in this year for 6.6 .6 billion with a price to revenue ratio of two to 2.3. So we are offering an outstanding test with a phenomenal need. Please allow pediagnostics to save babies' lives. So that's my contact information and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pediagnostics. And next up is Insurogen. I'm very excited to be speaking to you today. Uh, my name is Lucas Arzola, and I'm a PhD student in chemical engineering with a designated emphasis in biotechnology. Before I go on with my presentation, I'd like to thank the Big Bang organizers, the, the judges for their feedback, also our mentors, especially Professor Karen McDonald and Peter Matlock, and finally my teammates. Um, we entered Big Bang with an idea, and we're proud to see how it has evolved through the process. And we cannot thank you enough for all the people that gave us the feedback. So I'm the team leader for Insurgen, and we are a biotechnology company that aims to commercialize SwiftVax, an innovative technology platform for production of veterinary and human vaccines. So I'd like you to think back to the H1N1 crisis and how devastating it was for a country. The US government spent more than a billion dollars in development, and this was still not enough to make the vaccines that were needed by the patients. It became evident from uh, this crisis that the current vaccine production methods are outdated, basically because of the long development times they require of at least six months. There's definitely a need for responsive, cost-effective, and scalable manufacturing technologies for vaccines. Out of this need, our company in Syrian was born, and basically our mission is to develop high-quality and low-cost alternatives to biotherapeutics using our proprietary plant-based technology. And our value proposition is that we can make vaccines so cost-effectively that they become affordable to all customers and enabling us to open up new markets within the vaccine industry. 
So I'll explain how we in Serbia will be able to do that. Our innovation is really using tobacco plants as biofactories. For the sake of a comparison, let's look at uh, how a uh, normal vaccine production facility looks like. Um, it is an expensive facility because it requires uh, expensive equipment, costlier materials, and significant energy, all to make a life-saving product. Enter our technology, SwiftVax, which has a patent pending. You can see that we replace the upstream part of the facility with tobacco plants that only require sunlight, water, and soil to be able to produce vaccines. So as you can see, our method is cheaper. We get huge savings in capital costs of facilities and also of operating expenses. It's also faster. We can go from gene to vaccine in only six weeks. Compare that to six months using traditional processes. And we can also be responsive to outbreaks, which is a capability that vaccines have never achieved before. We're the most efficient because it's a plant-based technology. We're able to create the highest volumes of vaccine at the lowest cost. And finally, we're extremely safe. With our technology, there's no need to generate transgenic plants and put them on the field. So there's no concerns about putting genes on the environment. That way, the regulatory concerns are less, which also drives the cost down further. Also, since we're making uh, proteins in a plant, there's no concerns of cross-contamination within human pathogens in the final product. So let's look at how our core technology works briefly. We're able to take advantage of three biological systems in synergy, a plant virus, a bacteria, and a tobacco leaf. Basically, we're able to grow tobacco plants in a field. We harvest those leaves and bring them inside the facility. We engineer a bacteria that is able to deliver our DNA onto the tobacco leaf. And then we have a plant virus that helps uh, replicate and accumulate the vaccine in high numbers inside the leaf. Finally, we're able to purify the protein out of the leaf and then sell it as a vaccine. Insurance is first targeting the vaccine market because it is large and growing. As you can see, vaccines are worldwide around a $24 billion market. It is growing 13% over the next four years. Most of this market is controlled by large manufacturers. And the main barriers to entry are, as I said, um, large initial capital investments, long development times, as well as regulatory approval. The features of our suite back technology are able to diminish the first to entry barriers, so all the risk relies on the regulatory approval. For this reason, the go-to-market strategy will be based on reducing the regulatory risk, and that's why we will target the animal market first. This way, we can successfully establish an animal vaccine and get USDA approval, and then we can transition to produce human vaccines we can get FDA approval. As you can see, animal vaccines have an advantage in that we can have a shorter regulatory timeline of only two or three years, compared to five to seven years for human vaccines. So now you can, you can see that we can get a faster return of investment and we can create value for our investors. Also, there's a market. The technology fulfills a customer need because farmers demand low-cost vaccines because of the profit margins they have per animal. And our capability of producing extremely affordable vaccines we enable us to open up new markets within the vaccine industry. Our first target product that Inserion is considering is a vaccine for Newcastle disease, although we are evaluating several other candidates in the pipeline. Newcastle disease um, is a disease in poultry, and it's a big public health concern because um, it is able to transfer from animals to the human population. There's also economic impact, so there's around 8 billion chickens in the United States only. So you can see how an outbreak would be very devastating for farmers and for the industry. Also, uh, another convenient thing about choosing Newcastle is that the development costs are low. Um, clinical trials are cheaper in poultry compared to other animals such as cattle, so these are um, less costs that we had to go through before getting a product into the market. And then finally, there's a market for Newcastles in the U.S. We have estimated the total opportunity to be around $142 million. Our business model looks like this. We want to co-develop vaccines with different companies by doing partnerships. Then we want to do in-house manufacturing in a facility using our SwiftVax technology. So we want to protect our asset, our core technology. Then we're able to outsource the distribution to other parties that can get it to the end customer, which is the farmer and the patient. We estimate that the uh, revenue can come from sales and royalties, and we estimate that um, distributors will be um, willing to pay around 70% of the final end price for us to manufacture the vaccine for them. Here's a quick look at the technology landscape in terms of the production cost and also the speed of production. 
In the lower left, you can see traditional production technology for vaccines, cell culture, and egg technologies. You can see they're really slow, and also they're expensive. As we move up uh, all the way to the upper right, we see that in serine and in sweetback technology is the cheapest and the fastest way to produce vaccines. Planning pharmaceuticals are an area that is up and coming, and some of the trends that have arisen in the industry that we feel help us are, for example, that Argo Sciences obtained approval for uh, Newcastle's uh, disease vaccine in poultry in 2006. However, they use plant cell culture. So this technique requires stainless steel bioreactors and expensive facilities. So we feel this is not a threat for us. Also, Bayer in 2010 was able to get, get approval for a phase one clinical trial for a human therapeutic in tobacco plants. It's a similar technology platform, but they use whole plants. So their facilities would need expensive robotics and facilities to be able to manipulate those plants. How are we different? We are different because we can produce vaccines from leaves that we harvest from the field. And this way, we're able to scale up or down easily and be able to meet demands for vaccines while having the lowest costs. Some of the milestones that can create value for Inserion and for our investors are, over the first two years, we expect to do lab scale development and preclinical trials. We will need around $2.2 million, we estimate, for this phase. Then we expect to move on to clinical trials and uh, develop our manufacturing facility. And remember I said we can get approval in only two years for an animal vaccine. So then, afterwards, we can get our first animal vaccine approved by 2015 and go to full-scale manufacturing and seek partnerships with other companies to develop additional products. The potential exit opportunities are through acquisition in any stage between the start of clinical trials all the way through manufacturing. So we estimate that with an initial investment of $2.2 million and the help of investors, we will be able to complete our first milestones and get all the way clinical trials. Um, we feel that this cost could go even down even further if we're able to negotiate with the university because it's a patent owned by the university. So we can uh, negotiate not to pay them until after. So this cost may be less. Additionally, we feel we can get funding um, for this technology through government grants such as SBIR. We can also uh, apply for funding through Gates Foundation and others. Our team uh, is experienced in the science. I'm a PhD student and I work uh, with this technology on my research. So I'm, I have produced those proteins with this technology routinely in my lab and I'm confident that they, it, the technology works. Also, we have experience in our team with business and intellectual property. We also have a seasoned board of advisors um, that have started companies in this area in plant pharmaceuticals as well as animal health. And we also have advice, an advisor that has brought an animal vaccine to market. So we feel with the help of our advisors, we will be able to take our company to the next level. We also uh, will be looking eventually for uh, experienced management that can come in and help us uh, bring the vaccines to market as well. Some of the accomplishments to date, as I said, we have done last skill production in the lab using this technology. We have done an initial freedom to operate analysis and we feel that our patent that is pending has strong scientific merit and also protects our core technology. We acknowledge that we need a full legal counsel to um, analyze all the intellectual property landscape, so we're willing to work with our investors for this. We're also in, in initial talks with the UC Davis Tech Transfer Office to license this patent from the university. And then we have had talks with senior management with Mer from Merrill, which is an animal health company, and also we have interest from a potential partner in Sacramento. So to summarize, Insurgent can provide a solution for an unmet need which is a cost-efficient cost and responsive production platform for vaccines. UC Davis is a great location to start a company with all the expertise available and relevant to our company, such as engineering, veterinary health, medicine, and agriculture. And finally, our core technology is very promising because we can only use it to make vaccines, but also other proteins for personalized medicine, biodefense, and also biosimilars, which is a market that's growing in the future. So please contact me, Lucas Arzola, if you'd like to learn more about Inserogen. Thank you. BioLactia is up next. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me here. I am uh, Daniela Barile. I am Associate Director at the Food for Health Institute, and I'm here to present BioLactia, which is a spin-off of the Food for Health Institute. 
We are a life science company and we are developing medical foods that are natural, safe, they are milk derived and they are clinically validated for application in pediatric, geriatric and emergency nutrition. So every year there is 4 million of new baby in the United States. About 45% of them is at risk of infectious disease because they are either born premature and Lorna explain you all the tremendous disease that can, you know, the premature baby go uh, forward to. And they are also born from a C-section which also uh, leads to inappropriate colonization of their microflora and so they are more prone to disease. If you think about four million babies and worldwide, more than two millions die every year because of diarrheal diseases, which are still enteric infection caused by pathogenic bacteria. And every baby who goes to the hospital because of diarrheal disease in the United States costs $1,600 per year to the healthcare. So the problem is that we have all these enteric infections and that the current drugs are not effective in resolving the disease because antibiotics are only effective, effective locally and temporarily. They kill the bacteria but not everything. So there is still some niche that are inside the organism and sooner or later they will come back. And the result is that, that these bacteria will be become resistant to the antibiotic, and so you will never solve the problem. So our solution is to prevent the infection instead of just treating where it happens. So we have in mind more than one product. We are going to offer protection against disease to all the vulnerable population, not only at risk infants, but also immunocompromised elderly. The statistics are telling us that in 2050, elderly population will be the most dominant segment. And right now, there is not only one product that is really targeted to this population. And we don't want to forget the population in disaster area, as is well known that after a few days after there's an earthquake, like epidemic disease spread around. And also our troops fighting for the safety that are in deployment in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, the statistics says that 65% of them suffer from chronic enteric disease, including diarrheal disease. And our product will make their life better. So just a couple of defi definitions to understand what we're talking about. Our basic ingredients are probiotics and prebiotics. So probiotics are the good bacteria that offer protection against the bad bacteria. We are all born with some probiotic bacteria in our gut, but during life they, they decrease, and so we need to supplement them. So just to point, the probiotics are the good little angel in the cartoon but they will not survive. Even if you administer probiotics, they will only last 24 hours if they have not the, the right fuel in the organism. And what is the right fuel for them is the food. So they need their favorite food, which are prebiotics. Prebiotics are not digestible carbohydrates that feed the good bacteria. Here is an example. It's a commercially available, simple, very simple linear carbohydrate. So the better way to work with these ingredients is to use them in combination. Probiotics plus prebiotics, the bacteria plus the food, which are referred as symbiotics. But we have more because we found some prebiotic molecules inside milk that are not able only to feed the good bacteria but also to fight the bad bacteria. Because this is the situation. Imagine you are inside the body, this is the intestine, and every time that we get sick is because of a pathogenic attack of the bacteria that try to attack us. How do they do? They enter the body and they look for some molecules, some target molecules, so they can attach and then they can cause the infection. The molecules they're looking like, they're these molecules. These are our, they, they, these are our unique dairy-based molecules called prebiotic oligosaccharides. And they look exactly just like molecule on the intestine surface. So the bad bacteria here in red, they are looking for this, but they found this, and this is free. This is flushed away. So the bacteria are fooled by our molecule and they cannot cause the infection. At the same time, our molecules are able to feed selectively the good bacteria. 
And we have all the genetic studies to demonstrate this. So we can fight the bad, feed the good, the result is prevent the disease. So Biolactia's competitive ad advantage is that we have a partnership with a world leader dairy processor because the molecules we discovered are in milk, but they are also in a byproduct called whey. And right now, whey is a surplus. And if the company, the dairy company, don't find a use for it, they have to pay to dispose of it. And Hilmar alone produced 13 million of pounds per day of whey. And so we found a solution for that, which is good molecule in it. So our molecules will be sourced locally here in California, but also worldwide, because even in India, in Africa, everywhere there's a dairy, there's a, this product. And everywhere there's the technology to produce whey protein, there is the good molecules. So we have a product in mind, and we gave a name, Give Life, which is give a second opportunity to all the people that are fighting with pathogenic bacteria and sickness. Give Life is a natural, safe, clinically validated product made only of mo the prebiotics molecules originating from milk, dairy products, and probiotic bifidobacteria. It's able to prevent the enteric infection, and being a medical food, it does not require any FDA clinical trials. Of course, we are doing our own clinical trial to demonstrate the efficacy. So we have in mind two formulations. One formulation will be a liquid fluid here, which will need to be refrigerated. And so we imagine this one for the hospital. So for infants in the hospital and for the elderly in the hospital. But the other formulation is in powder. It, it is for area where there is no access to refrigeration, like in disaster area and in mil military units. So Biolactia is a spin-off of the Food for Health Institute, and it's very recent. We decided to uh, form the legal entity in November 2009, but since then we have already established a proof of concept and we have formalized the partnership with Hilmar Ingredients, which gave us a really superior position in bargain because we have the knowledge to guide them where the good molecules are, and this is a unique position. And we have already applied for $200,000 of funding for the SBIR as Biolactia. In the next few months, we're going to file for intellectual property to protect our unique formulation, which are combination of specific prebiotic molecule with selected probiotic bacteria. We are going to test marketing in 2012, and later, on the same year, we're going to enter the market in the US. We have already, we have been actually contacted by several companies in France and in Italy, like Britain International and Etin Cell and Probiotical, who are interested in marketing our product in Europe. So we think uh, 2014 we will enter Europe market and also globally. Finally, in 2015, we have a next strategy, which would be an acquisition by a pharma or by a food company. Here are the market projection. So in absence of uh, any similar product, because our product is new in the market, we are basing our projection on the ingredients we have. We have probiotic bacteria, which are available, and prebiotics. So our molecules have a plus because they can also prevent infection. But we are basing the projection on the molecules, on the, on the molecules of prebiotic that are available right now, which are the gas galacto-oligosaccharides from milk. And the market, it's huge already, is $19 billion worldwide. So we're being really modest here, and we imagine to have a smooth penetration of the market from 0.1% to 10% in five years, which nonetheless take us with a forecast revenue in five years of 1.9 billion. So the team. I am Daniela Barilla and I'm the Chief Technical Officer. I am a pharmacist and I have a PhD in food science with an emphasis on dairy products. The CEO position is temporarily filled by Ricardo Locascio, who is uh, now incubating Biolacta's idea of physics venture in Boston. The Vice President of Research is Angela Zivkovic. She's right now in a honeymoon. She couldn't be here. Just got married. Bad timing. 
but she is currently the associate direction of business development, development at the Food for Health Institute. And we have also a vice president of clinical research, who is uh, Jennifer Smilovic, who is the associate director of clinical research at the Food for Health Institute. And she has already conducted all kinds of clinical trials with dairy derived molecules in infants and in elderly. Our scientific advisory board include the world class scientists, and some are here in this room, and I'm really happy to see them, like Bruce German, Carlito Lebria, and David Mills who are really, really famous in, you know, discovery of new molecules and, and bioactive from milk. And we are lucky enough to have Andy Hargadon from the UC Davis Center of Entrepreneurship as our uh, advisory board for business. And we all, the four of us, we all went through the Center for Entrepreneurship Academy, and Andy has been such a great leader and a guru. <laughs> So to summarize, BioLactia was founded only recently, in November 2009, but our first product is almost market ready. We have applied for SBIR phase grant one, who was $200,000, but the next phase is 1.5 million. And we are still seeking money from angel investor, like right now we need $100,000 to cover the intellectual property cost. And we're looking for $500,000 next year to finish clinical trial and to expand our team because we know that we need to grow the company management, marketing, and sales. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, last up is Last Mile Designs. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Andre Misik with Last Mile Designs. Uh, first, uh, my team and I are thrilled to be here. Thank everybody who made it possible. It's, it's a great opportunity. I see the guy smiling over there. Um, Last Mile Designs uh, uh, makes and operates uh, self-service uh, package pickup kiosks. Uh, receiving packages at home in cities like San Francisco and New York is a major hassle for working professionals. My wife and I live in San Francisco, and uh, if I order uh, a place an order online and send it to my home address today, uh, what most likely is going to happen, the UPS guy will show up at my door when I'm at work, uh, will knock on the door, uh, will realize that I'm not there. Uh, he, he will leave a, a, a slip like this saying that I'll be back tomorrow uh, because uh, we live in a busy street where uh, leaving packages in the street is really not an option, and uh, we don't really have a... a, 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 a staff member uh, uh, in, in our building. Uh, they'll try to re-deliver the package uh, two more times and then send it back. Uh, it's inconvenient, it's frustrating, and, and it's wasteful. And it's not just San Francisco and, and New York. Uh, we we talked quite a, to quite a few people in Davis, and uh, many people kind of recognize the problem. Um, to understand the size of the problem, we calculated how many packages uh, fail in the first delivery in San Francisco and New York uh, that are shipped to home addresses. Uh, UPS and FedEx, the two major transportation carriers in the United States, deliver about 5 billion packages a year. Um, about 12% of them uh, go to addresses in uh, San Francisco and New York. Uh, not all of them uh, obviously go to ham home addresses. Many of them go to uh, commercial or uh, business addresses. But about a third of them end up being shipped to apartment complexes, like the one where I live in San Francisco. 20% of all the packages that uh, uh, are sent to uh, residential addresses in the two cities fail in the first attempt. Uh, I, I work in the logistics and transportation industry, and it's a uh, well-known fact in the industry that uh, a city like New York, San Francisco, Boston, uh, Paris, London, and uh, Milan kind of suffer from this problem. So one in five packages fails in the first attempt uh, when delivered to homes. So we think the market for uh, inconvenient deliveries is at least uh, 35 million deliveries a year, which is huge. Uh, the population of California, I believe, is uh, less than 38 million, uh, uh, 38 million people. And uh, this market is growing. It's really driven by uh, uh, e-commerce and uh, retail uh, sales, e-commerce retail sales are expected to grow at about 10 to 20 percent a year. So, so our solution to the problem is uh, a network of kiosks uh, fully automa automated uh, self-service uh, kiosks that we call the Zing kiosks. The way it works, uh, you send your package to the uh, neighborhood Zing kiosk. Uh, a FedEx or a UPS delivery person uh, shows up at the pa uh, during the day, deposits your package into it, and you can retrieve it uh, at the end of the day or uh, over the weekend at your convenience. 
we looked at the competition and uh, uh, what, what really uh, sets apart uh, our solution is uh, availability and density. So our Zinc kiosk will be the first solution in the market that could be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a kiosk that has no attendant. You can come pick up your package any time of the day you want to. Uh, as well as uh, density. So we'd like to install a Zinc kiosk in every three by three block ra radius in a city like San Francisco. You'll find them in your neighborhood drugstore, convenience store, and on uh, city streets. Our pricing model is simple. We'll charge you three dollars per package at the time of pickup. And it's significantly less expensive than uh, the alternatives that exist today. I think uh, really the two closest alternatives are uh, stores by UPS, where you can uh, rent a box for an extended period of time, and a PO box at United States Postal Service. And, and both of those options cost significantly more if you count uh, the cost per package. To gain and defend our market share, we'll partner with uh, retail stores like Walgreens and Safeway. Uh, a store like Walgreens will gain not only additional foot traffic from customers who come to pick up their packages, but also revenue. We will pay uh, Walgreens rent for housing uh, our kiosks. It's a model that's pretty well uh, established in the industry. Companies like Redbox, a DVD rental a kiosk company, uh, already does something similar. We estimate that a company like FedEx uh, uh, loses about three to eight dollars per redelivery in a city like San Francisco. It's pretty expensive to redeliver a package because uh, uh, when the package fails to be delivered in the first attempt, the driver has to take it back to the depot. They have to check it into the system, store it in a secure place. Next morning, somebody has to retrieve it, put it in a truck, and then try to deliver it again. And, and chances are, if the delivery uh, uh, failed in the first attempt, it will probably fail again in the second and third attempt, and the package will be sent back. Finally, online merchants, uh, we think they can gain additional sales by uh, partnering with us. Uh, today, uh, many customers choose not to make purchases online and send to the, them to their home addresses because uh, the del uh, deliveries are inconvenient or maybe not possible. Uh, and the online merchants will be able to uh, uh, capitalize on, on those sales. These partnerships, as long as the uh, kiosk design, uh, uh, we're hoping will create a strong enough uh, value proposition uh, where customers will, will use uh, their neighborhood kiosk on a regular basis uh, uh, for convenient deliveries. Our kiosks are connected. They're connected to the carriers like UPS and FedEx, as well as customers. So when the FedEx driver shows up, uh, and deposits a package for you, you will uh, automatically get an email notification that's saying that there is a package uh, waiting in slot zone. So, if when you pick up a cap package, an electronic signal will go back to the uh, carrier telling them that uh, delivery has been successfully completed. Uh, and of course, uh, our central database will know uh, at, uh, where the packages are in our kiosks and uh, what transactions are hap happening throughout the day. The kiosks are secure. The outer shell, the red uh, shell that you see on the screen, uh, is made of heavy-duty steel. Uh, it's anchored into the ground, so you cannot move it. And the gray doors make it, uh, ma are made of metal. They are sectional doors that expose only one slot at a time that you're allowed to retrieve a package from. And they're easy to use. If you've used a DVD uh, rental kiosk like Redbox, it, it's no different. You slide your card, you retrieve your package, and off you go. We sized uh, our kiosks, or the inside of the kiosk, the slots in the kiosk, to accommodate 90% of the packages that uh, are sent to home uh, addresses in San Francisco and New York today. So to do this uh, slotting exercise, we actually conducted a survey of about 130 potential customers, asking them about the sizes of the packages that they've ordered for personal consumption recently. It turns out that 92% uh, of the packages were a size of uh, a case of wine or smaller. Uh, and we slotted our package to accommodate all those sizes and uh, uh, basically accommodate 92% or more of the uh, packages that uh, delivered uh, in San Francisco today. Our nimble and efficient team consists of four UC Davis graduate students uh, with backgrounds in logistics, marketing, information systems, uh, and research and development. We have two advisors uh, that ground our team uh, Greg, who's in the audience, uh, is uh, VP of Sales at Conformity and advised us on sales and strategy. 
Uh, Sam Renwick with uh, the Salter Group uh, in the Bay Area advises us on financial matters. In the first year, we plan to have uh, uh, full-time positions in management, operations, and business development. By year two, we'd like to add uh, uh, functions in finance, marketing, research and development, uh, information technology, and field services. And by year three, we hope to expand to both San Francisco and New York and have a 50-person strong team uh, serving in the two markets. We made our financial projections based on results achieved by Redbox. Redbox is a, a DVD rental kiosk a company that operates 13,000 kiosks in the United States today. And they've been recently acquired by uh, Coinstar, a public company. Uh, to uh, create our pro forma uh, financial statements, we made several key assumptions that I wanted to highlight. Number one, we expect revenues of $3 per package. Uh, our kiosk will handle on average 6,100 packages per year. Obviously, the kiosk will not be able to utilize or won't be able to utilize every single slot in the kiosk, so we, we expect the utilization rate to be about 60%. Uh, we plan to have 2,000 kiosks in San Francisco and New York market. Uh, and we are planning to bring down the acquisition cost to 14,000 per kiosk. Our business plan calls for three uh, stages of expansion, and we are requesting $1.3 million in uh, stage uh, number one. Uh, in stage one, we will complete developing, manufacture, and deploy the first 30 kiosks uh, in, the, in San Francisco. Um, in stage two, we will uh, deploy these kiosks to the rest of the city, and we'll need an additional $4 million in funding. And finally, in stage three, we'll expand in New York, and we'll need an additional $11 million to do so. We're excited about uh, solving this problem, uh, making uh, our cities a better place to live. If you like the idea and would like to see one of the Zen kiosks in your town, uh, please cast your vote for us. I'd like to first thank all the teams that took part in Big Bang today, including our five finalists. Um, and now it's your chance to participate in Big Bang. It's time to select the People's Choice winner. If you could please take out your ballots found in your program. Take a quick second to fill in one choice for your winner of the People's Choice Award. Once you've completed your ballot, please pass the ballots to the middle where we can collect them. And I'd also like to do, introduce our final speaker for this evening. Kevin Coyle with DLA Piper will be giving the final presentation. Thank you. Okay, well, hello once again. Welcome to the, yes, the 10th annual installment of the UC Davis Big Bang Business Plan Competition. It's my distinct pleasure to have been associated with this program since its inception, and I can honestly say it's been a thoroughly enjoyable and enriching experience. One of the questions inevitably asked of venture capital professionals is, when is a good time to start a company? Hint, the answer is, it's always a good time to start a good company. Now as I look back over these past 10 years, I wonder, was that a good time to start a business plan competition? It was 1999 when a group of UC Davis students approached us and other members of the high-tech industry in Sacramento Davis area with the idea of starting a student-run business plan competition, similar to the many well-known competitions at institutions such as UC Berkeley, Stanford, Harvard, Rice, Notre Dame, many others. The basic idea was to match up UC Davis business students with UC Davis technology, give the students a chance to pitch their ideas to angels and VC investors, maybe start an actual company or two, and have some fun. Our first year, which culminated in our first award show in April 2001, was successful beyond all expectations. More than 50 teams registered for the contest. Finalists that year included Optomedical Diagnostics, a developer of optical tools for cancer diagnosis. A company called VisualCalc, which is an online financial data analytics provider that is still going strong here locally. And our first winner, a company called Emergent Software. Emergent was originally formed to develop applications that facilitate the tracking and control of a product's progress during its development phase. They received venture backing from Worldview, Jerusalem Venture Partners, and Cisco Ventures. 
And in 2005, they merged with the company that developed the Gamebrio uh, uh, video game development tools. They are now a leading provider of video game development tools, tools which have been integral to the development of such games as Sid Meier's Pirates, Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, and my favorite, Warhammer Online, Age of Reckoning. I kind of feel proud about having a little role in that. So 2001, turns out actually it was a great year for starting a movie franchise. The first Lord of the Rings, the first Harry Potter, and the first Shrek were the top grossing movies in 2001. Ocean's Eleven was released in 2001. And who could forget the, the immortal The Animal with Rob Schneider, topped only by the brilliant Corky Romano, films apparently so starkly original that no producer would even think of doing a sequel for fear of tarnishing the legend. And what of the seed and early stage investment capital market in 2001? Remember the tech bubble? It all seems so quaint now that we've experienced a real economic crisis. But 2001 was the beginning of the market downturn from the overheated frenzy of the internet tech boom. From 2000 to 2001, seed stayed investment investments dropped from 50% in the United States from 281 to 142 deals and from about 485 million in 2000 to 256 million in 2001. First round investments feared, fared even worse, going from an astounding 2,672 deals totaling over $28 billion in the year 2000 to 954 deals totaling about 7.6 billion in, in 2001. And it only got worse over the next couple years with the impact of 9-11. Sounds like a perfect time to launch a business plan competition designed to foster uh, startup companies. So not such a great year for early stage investing, but I know what you're thinking. What about all that great music in 2001? Topping the charts was the Lady Marmalade remake by Christina Aguilera. And who doesn't remember Butterfly by Crazy Town and He Loves You Not by Dream? Ah, uh, it takes me back. There was even a group back then called Destiny's Child. Whatever happened to them? The top selling album of 2001 was One by a group called The Beatles. Okay, maybe not such a great year for musical innovation. But how were things at the tech transfer front? In fiscal 2001, a total of 86 inventions were reported to the UC Davis tech transfer and, and total UC Davis invention portfolio at that time totaled 612. As a point of reference, this portfolio compares closely to UCLA's and UC Berkeley's and behind the two largest portfolios in the system, which are UC San Diego and UCSF. Also in 2001, UC Davis Tech Transfer managed 274 patents and had a portfolio of 410 licenses, of which 350 were plant licenses and 60 were utility licenses. Those strawberry licenses have been a strong revenue generator for the UC system over the years. The television set was undergoing a change in 2001 as well. While ER, Friends, and the Westworld were still going strong, the ratings were quickly shifting to the reality shows, with Survivor as the juggernaut and a Fox version of an obscure British talent show was launching. So let's recap. 2001, horrible music, tech bubble bursts, great year for movies, tech transfer in a holding pattern, and American Idol lurking. So now we come to today. After a few ups and downs in the early stage investment market seems to be rebounding back into shape. Last year, the number of seed deals was back to 2001 levels, although deal size remained down, and first round investments were getting closer to 2001 levels. By all accounts, Q1 of 2010 continues, looks to continue the slow but sure recovery in the early stage investment market. On the tech transfer side, UC Davis's utility patent portfolio has increased by well over 50% from 2001, and its patent portfolio has increased by over 65%. Perhaps most importantly, UC Davis's invention portfolio, which are inventions reported to tech transfer, stood at a whopping 913 at the end of fiscal 2009, a huge increase over the 612 reported in 2001. And anecdotally, it certainly seems like invention activity has further increased during fiscal 2010. All this is a tribute to the efforts of the administration, faculty, staff, and students at UC Davis. It's no secret that UC Davis has substantially upped its commitment to entrepreneurial activity on campus in a big way in the past few years, 
And those of us who've been associated with Big Bang are proud to have contributed in some small way to these accomplishments. So after a long day of judging, I think I can report that Big Bang celebrates its 10th year in great shape. We listened to 10 excellent presentations today, all of which are legitimate business plans that with hard work, dedication, and perseverance could easily become more UC Davis success stories. It was a challenge to say the least to pick the five finalists, but I think you agree that these teams deserve the recognition. I know that one day in the not so distant future, I will stop by the last mile kiosk near UC Davis to pick up that package of BioLactica pro and prebiotic medical food, specially formulated with bovine milk oligosaccharides, especially formulated for my elderly friend, Andy Harganon. <laughs> we'll take a long walk through the Incerogen's non-transgenic tobacco biofactory and watch the sun gleam off the brand new Nomad Technologies campus headquarters, which itself is coated with metal organic silicon thin film in a variety of colors, while we contemplate how cool it is that there are people like the founders of Pediagnostics and so many others of you in this competition and out there as well, who are willing to step up and passionately commit themselves to the well-being of our most vulnerable children. So congratulations to all of the finalists and indeed to all of the participants in the 2010 Big Bang Business Plan Competition. Whether you win a prize or not, know that to quote Teddy Roosevelt, the credit belongs to those who are actually in the arena, who know the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spend themselves for a worthy cause, who at best know the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst fail while daring greatly, so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. Thanks again to all of the judges, these are incredibly busy individuals who give huge amounts of time to this process, not just today, but throughout the school year, because like me, they believe in entrepreneurship at UC Davis. And thanks also to this year's student organizers who once again have somehow managed to continue to improve this competition while actually completing their MBA classwork. Amazing job, everyone. Thanks. All right. Um, I apologize for the delay. It was a fierce competition for people's choice. Um, but after two recounts, we are pleased to announce that Peony Gnostics is the winner of the People's Choice Award. Your second place winner for the 10th annual Big Bang UC Davis GSM Business Plan Competition is Nomad. The grand prize winner of the 10th annual Big Bang Business Plan Competition is in Serogen. I'd like to say one final thank you to all our teams, sponsors, mentors, faculty members, everyone who took part and helped out in Big Bang this year. And I'd like to especially thank Christine Darter, who put blood, sweat, and tears into making this competition happen. Christine?
and all of you. Thank you very much.